Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you because you've given us another day of opportunity whereby we can prepare our souls to meet you in peace. Father, we're asking that as we come this day, that the sword of the Spirit, the fire of the Spirit, and this word that is sharper than any two-edged sword will pierce into our souls, to the marrows of our bones and to our hearts in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that we will not come here in vain, that as you have called us, warning us, challenging us, reminding us to prepare to meet our God, that this day will be a time of preparation indeed in Jesus' name, that as your word will come out, it will come on fertile ground, and you will wake us up out of the spirit of slumber and deep sleep into the spirit that is alive and awake and agile and active in Jesus' name. So that every one of us, at the sound of the preaching tonight, will prepare to meet our God. Do this for us and the glory will be yours. The blessing will be ours. In Jesus' name we pray. When in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, and we're in verse 1 again. Last week we came to this chapter and we started looking at this chapter. And I told you last week that that church was a large church. And as a large church, they had their problems. You remember when I told you about how this Deeper Life Church started in 1973 with just a small number of people. And I told you at that time that the administration or, or the things we did in the church the workers in the church were very small in number, but now it's a large church, and large churches have their problems. Now, in large churches, you'll find two categories of people. You'll find pillars in the church, you'll find caterpillars in the church. And that is why I have titled the lesson and the study of today as pillars or caterpillars in the church with a question mark at the end leaving you to choose which one you want to be but i'll explain to you pillars in the church you know in the church auditorium here the roof and the whole building is um, being held up by these poles all over the building we call them the pillars in the church in the building and these pillars are stable, the pillars are steadfast, and the pillars are just, you know, they're made of the right material. Because if the pillars are weak, the church, the auditorium will be weak. If the pillars are strong, the pillars will give us a strong church. But then I t I'm telling you today again that there are also caterpillars in the church. Those caterpillars are just crawling in, crawling out. Then they are destructive. They bite away, they eat away at the pillars of the church. As the pillars are doing their best to stand, the caterpillars are doing their best or their worst to eat up the standing pillars. And if the pillars are not made of the right material, the right stuff, before a long time, the caterpillars will eat up the pillars in the church and the church will collapse. Now, let me talk to you about the pillars in the church. In uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, were they, when the number of the disciples was multiplied. What was the reason for the number of disciples being multiplied? Only one reason. There have been some pillars in that church. And those pillars were preaching. They were praying. They were ministering. They were proclaiming the gospel. Those pillars were constant. They were always there. Every time you open the door of the church, you'll see the pillars there. They were stable. They were steadfast. They were sound. They were spiritual. And they were dependable. You could depend upon them. And it was because of their ministry of the word and of prayer, of intercession, of counseling, of helping, of administration, that the number of disciples were multiplying. Turn to uh, that same uh, chapter, verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and they said it is not reason it will not stand to reason it is not reasonable that we leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 4 we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Those were the pillars of the church they were standing on that word 
And as they were steadfast and standing, sound and spiritual, they were holding up the church. The life of the church was very good because of them. Now let me run you through some verses in the Bible in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. And when James and Severus and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. That backs up exactly what I've been telling you. The apostles, James, Peter, John, were referred to as pillars in the church. Pillars in the church. And they were right in that church holding up the edifice, holding up the church, building up the church in the most holy faith. If you turn to the Old Testament, you'll discover that the buildings of those days were held up by pillars. If the pillars fell, those houses fell. If the pillars were standing, those houses will be standing. In Judges chapter 16, verse 26, Judges chapter 16, verse 26, And Samson said unto the Lord that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that is, permit me, allow me, give me chance, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. You see, the pillars were holding up the, ch the building. And uh, as long as the pillars were still standing firm, the house will be standing firm. And so Samson said, now let me feel the strength of those pillars. And I want to lean on those pillars. You can lean upon the pillars in the church. You can receive comfort from the pillars of the church. The pillars in the church are the people that are allowing God to use them to build up the life of the church. But do you know, the moment the pillars fall, that moment the house will collapse. Because, let me show you this in this passage we are reading now. In Judges chapter 16, from verse 27 now. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof, about 3,000 men and women, that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called upon the Lord and said, O Lord God, Remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenger of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which he, it was borne up, and uh, of one on the right hand, and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew at his in his life. When the pillars collapsed, the house collapsed and the people perished. And so you can see if you are a pillar in the church, you'll be standing firm. If you're a pillar in the church, we'll be holding up the church. If you're a pillar in the church, we'll be edifying. And in Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar, and the brazen walls, and, it, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. So then we're being told, as we're reading in the scriptures, that pillars are strong. And the strong members of the church, the strong officers of the church, the apostles of the early church acted as pillars. By their lives, they were pillars. By their conduct, they were pillars. By their ministrations, they were pillars. By the way they held everything together in unity and in love, they were pillars in the church. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, here Jesus gives the promise to members of the church. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12 Him that overcometh 
I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and it shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, if you are a pillar in the church here on earth, you will be a pillar in the temple of God in heaven. If you are standing, if you are stable, if you are steadfast, if you are sound, if you are spiritual in the church here, and you are a pillar in the church on earth, you will be a pillar in the temple of our God in heaven. But if you are not a pillar here, if you are not an overcomer here, there is no way you can be a pillar in the temple of God in heaven. If you are not an overcomer, overcoming sin, overcoming Satan, overcoming a critical spirit, overcoming temptation, overcoming the things that war against your soul to pull you down, to make you unstable, unsteadfast, and to make you the things that are trying to pull you out of the church, if you don't overcome it, you are not going to be an overcomer. You will not be a pillar in the temple of God in heaven. But to be a pillar here, you will need to be stable. Are you? If you're a pillar here, you'll be a pillar there. Now, I've talked to you about pillars in the church. And I've told you that those early believers, the apostles in particular, by the very life they lived, by the very influence they had in the church, and by their uh, bringing the church together, keeping the church together, endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith in all the believers, they were pillars in the church. But alas, there were also caterpillars in the church. What are caterpillars? Pillars stand, caterpillars crawl. You know, caterpillars are the people that don't grow in the church. They profess they, have, they are saved. They profess they are children of God. They profess they have the life of Christ. But instead of standing straight, instead of standing firm, they are crawling. And they are not able to hold their body up. Their body goes parallel to the earth. I'm telling you something. The caterpillars are the people that are very near the earth. They cannot face God and look up and stand up and just stand erect facing heaven, looking up to heaven. But they are very much in contact with the earth. I'm telling you, they are carnal. And because they are carnal, they are, they are not able to stand as pillars in the church, but rather they are caterpillars. But now, you know how caterpillars work? I'm not talking of the modern caterpillar that actually pulls now a house that you see, that is operated by men. I'm talking about a type of insect that will eat up the pillars in the church. You remember when we had the Yoruba class, and uh, before we pulled it down to raise up a better place uh, where they're staying now, the pillars were made of wood. And uh, when, the, when the pillars are of wood, the caterpillars secretly will be eating away at the pillars of the church. And that is what caterpillars do. If the pillars are not made of the right stuff, not of iron, not of stone, not of cement, if they are just of wood, weak material, the caterpillars will be able to eat them up. But the caterpillars eat secretly. And that is the life of caterpillars in the church. Men in the church who come out as Christians, who uh, live and who profess to be Christians, but secretly, with their mouths, they eat up the pillars of the church. With their mouth, they dig deep at the pillars of the church. Secretly, they are making the church to be collapsing. Secretly, they are eating up the strength of the church. And those are caterpillars. Let me show you references in the Bible. In Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And I'm reading... Verse 46. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locust. When you find a church evangelizing and the church is not increasing, something is happening. The caterpillars in the church are eating up the increase. By their mouth, by their gossiping, by their murmuring, by their complaining, by their backbiting. What are they doing? They're driving away the new converts. The caterpillars eat up the increase of the church in every zone, in every area, and in the whole church. And when you find a church that is laboring much, a church that is evangelizing much, and yet that church is not increasing, something is happening. There are more caterpillars in that church than there are pillars. You know when the pillars are many in the church, something is happening. Those who are building up are many. 
those who are gathering together with Christ are many. And those who are increasing the labor of the church, the converts in the church, they are many. And the caterpillars are few. But then when the caterpillars are so very many, and all the time they are busy, eating up the increase, eating up the life of the people, eating up the pastor, eating up the preachers, eating up the zonal leaders, eating up the workers, that church cannot grow. And I want you to decide tonight which one you are. A pillar, building up, holding up, standing firm, keeping the church together, or a caterpillar eating up the church, destroying the church, dividing the church, pulling down the church, tearing down the church. In um, Psalm 105, verses 34 and 35, he spake, and the, cater- and the locusts came, and the caterpillars, and that without number. You know? Woe is unto that church when the caterpillars multiply without number. When those who tear down, when those who, who, who destroy with their mouth, when they multiply in the church, that church will be down. That church will be broken up. That church will just collapse. Now, let me tell you something. When you have wooden pillars, and the caterpillars or what you might call termites, I've been secretly eating up the pillars in the church. And internally, they have eaten up at the foundation of those pillars. A little rain will come. And a little storm will come. And a little wind will blow. What will happen to the, to the house? Because the pillars are weak, the caterpillars have eaten up the very root of those pillars. The storm and the wind will blow down the house. That's what happens to a church. When a church, very secretly, had been eaten up by caterpillars. When those who are gossiping and murmuring have been eating up the pastor, eating up the workers, have been criticizing everything going on in the church, a little problem will come, a little wind will blow, a little storm will arise, and the church is blown away. Because caterpillars have been busy for months, for weeks, for years, eating up. Let me ask you, how do you use your mouth? Are you eating up this church with your mouth? Criticizing this church with your mouth? Are you destroying this church with your mouth? So then you are not a pillar, you are a caterpillar. You may pretend to be a Christian, to be a believer, and to say that, oh yes, you love this church, and you know, this is a church where you were born again, and you are going to live and die in this church, but that critical spirit that is making you to criticize everything you see, making you to criticize the pastor, the preachers, the praying, the ministration, the study of the Bible, the, everything that you see, that critical tongue just makes you a caterpillar and you are the trouble of this church and you are the one pulling this church, tearing this church apart. And in verse 35 it says, they did eat up all the herbs in their land and they devour the fruit of their ground. In Joel... Daniel, Osea, then after that you have Joel. In Joel chapter 1, verse 4, that which the palmer one have left has the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left has the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm have left has the caterpillar eaten. And you know you cannot have it when you eat it up. Think about it. You buy a loaf of bread, and in the morning, you eat part of it. What happens? It becomes smaller. Or you buy a granut, and you eat part of it. What happens? It becomes smaller. Listen to me. If every time at the breakfast table, you and your wife, you are eating up the pastor, when you come the following Thursday, the pastor you have eaten a part out of, that pastor will become smaller in your eyes. When you eat up the pastor, while you are while you are eating your lunch and while you are eating your dinner, when you come back the following Monday, your pastor will be smaller because you are eating him up at the breakfast table, lunch table, dinner table. That means you are criticizing and talking about him. When you sit upon your bed or sleep in your bed, but you and your wife, you and your husband, and all you eat is your pastor. Well, if you are eating up that pastor every time you come to church, the more you eat him, the more you talk about him, the more you criticize him, the more it will become he will become smaller and smaller and smaller in your evaluation and in your eyes. He may pray more, he may study more, he may preach more but because you are eating him up he cannot remain the same 
he'll be smaller in your eyes. I know if you're eating up the, the pastor in front of your children, it's the same thing. The pastor becomes small in the sight of your children. And when the pastor prays, the children cannot believe anymore because the caterpillar is sitting away the pastor in the hole. And that is what happens in the church when the caterpillars eat up the workers in the church. I know it's a pity that in some churches, the caterpillars are just so many and the pillars are so few. And that is what came on the early church. The pillars were working for God. The pillars were building up. The pillars were unifying the church. But the caterpillars were murmuring and grumbling and complaining and gossiping and backbiting and whispering. And in, in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, I'm now reading verse 1 again. And in those days, when the number of the disciples multi was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians. Uh, against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now I've divided the study into four parts and it's a, it's a natural division because you find that word multiply in um, verse 1 and I call that the multiplication of the disciples. And in verse 1 you find the word murmuring I call that the murmuring of the discouraged because it's when you are discouraged that you murmur. And in verse 4, it says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And I call that the ministry of the diligent. Those apostles were diligent to notice the state of the church. And when there was a problem in the church, they were diligent enough to be able to solve that problem before the church collapsed. They were diligent and they had a ministry. And then in verse uh, 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men. What were these men to do? They were to help in the distribution of food and material things to the people. That's why I call uh, point four, men for the division. So you have four parts of the study. The multiplication of the disciples, the murmuring of the discouraged, the ministry of the diligent, and the men for the distribution. Now, the first point. It says, in those days, the number of the disciples was multiplied. You may not understand that. When the Bible says, the number of the disciples became multiplied. What does that mean? The disciples were multiplied, not churchgoers. Not just, not just those coming to church. You know, whenever we come to the meetings here, our ushers count and they give us the number of attendants. And sometimes they may give us um, 25,000, 26,000 on Sunday. But that's not talking about uh, disciples. It's talking about those who attend church service. And for Monday Bible study, they count. And it tells us the number of those who attend the Monday Bible study. For Thursday, they come, they count, and they tell us the number of those who are present. But you may be present, and you may not have the presence of God in your life. And I'm talking about the people that have the presence of God in their lives. They were not just physically present in the book of life in heaven. They were there. They were disciples. I give you eight points concerning disciples. So I can give you a chance to see and to decide whether you are a disciple or not. And in this church, we want the number of disciples to be multiplied. What are the characteristics of a disciple? Number one, disciples are those who are really saved, truly saved, soundly saved, genuinely saved. In a John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Those are the disciples, those who are saved, truly saved, really saved, soundly saved, genuinely saved. And they, they were saved enough to continue in the word of God. Immediately they were saved. There will be the love for the word of God in their hearts. They will want to study that word every morning they wake up. They will want to live by the word of God. And they will want to measure the standard of their lives by the word of God. Those are the disciples. And so when Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says, The number of disciples was multiplied. It was talking about those who were saved and those who are continuing in the word of God. Number 2. Disciples are people who love God and love Christ and love the brethren. Listen to me, it's in that order. It's not, you don't start with the love of the brethren first. You start with the love of God. 
Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And because you are now saved, you love that God. He's done so much for you. He has cleansed away your sin. He has delivered you from sin. He has written your name in the book of life. Because of that, there is a deep, great, high love in your heart for God. And you love Christ. Because Christ died for you. Christ went to the cross and he said, Father, forgive him because he does not know what he's doing. And you have been forgiven and your name is written in the book of the Lamb. And because of that, you love him and now you love the children of God and the followers of Christ. That's why I told you disciples are those who love God who love Christ and who love the brethren. And if you don't love God, you are not a disciple. If you don't love Christ, you are not a disciple. If you don't love the brethren how can you be a disciple? In John chapter 13 Verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye love, that ye also love one another. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. So number one, a disciple is one who is saved, soundly saved, genuinely saved, really saved. And this person is truly saved, and you can tell because his life has changed. He's a new creature. Number two, he loves God, he loves Christ, and he loves the brethren. And number three, the quality of a disciple, a true disciple. We see that in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, is one that is fully consecrated to God, to the service of God, at a high cost. Whatever others say, whatever others do, he loves God. And he does not allow anybody to pull him out of Christ and out of the church. And in Luke chapter 14 verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You know, he loves God more than daddy. He loves God more than mommy. And you know, there are church mommies and church daddies. Who wants to who want to make themselves your mommy, your daddy, and everything, every step you want to take, they want you to come and find out from them. They do not want you to see the pastor. They do not want you to see the zona leader. They say, why didn't you come to see me? Don't you know I'm your church daddy, church mommy? Listen to me. If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you love God more than a self-imposing daddy, self-imposing mommy. You love God more than a daddy or mommy or sister or brother or anybody on the face of the earth. At whatever cost, Whatever they say, whatever they do, they may even have something against the church and they want to influence you that, well, because I don't like that church anymore, why are you still going to that church? You say, listen to me, I came here to serve God, to serve Christ and to love the brethren. And you may decide what you want to do, but I am a disciple and I'm going to serve God, fully consecrated to God, whatever anybody may say. That's a disciple. Number one, he's saved. Number two, he loves God, he loves the brethren, he loves Christ. And number three, he is willing to serve God, whatever others may do, whatever others may say. Look at verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and follow and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, in all these references I'm, I'm reading to you, you see the word disciple. And these references are telling you what we have read about in Acts chapter 6 verse 1. The number of disciples were multiplied. These were people who were saved. These were people loving God, Christ, and the brethren. These were people willing to serve God at any cost and whatever others say. And they were the people that were willing to bear their cross. Bear their cross. And you know sometimes, my brother, my sister, the cross is heavy. When Jesus carried that cross, that cross was heavy. And the women were weeping for him. And he was sweating and bleeding under the weight and under the load of that cross. And sometimes he fell down. He took up that cross again and he was going to Calvary. The place of God's appointment. And you know, if you're a real disciple, you are bearing your cross. The cross may come to you in your place of work. You bear it. The cross may come to you in your home. You bear it. The cross may even come to you in the church. You bear it. It may be a cross of whatever size and whatever shape and whatever weight and if you're a real disciple you want to make heaven you are bearing that cross sometimes you can be tired under that, that cross under the weight of that cross you fall down you rise up again with the bible in your heart with the promises of god in your mouth with determination in your mind saying it is not far anymore heaven is near christ is near the trumpet will soon sound will soon be called on when the saints are marching in i want to be there and you know 
just stay in a few hours the Lord may come and he may call me home and I do not want to be found wanting when he comes therefore I will bear my cross I will bear my cross and you are going on your steps may be weary they may be slow you may be tired you may be sweating you may even be bleeding you may be crying there may be tears coming over in your eyes but you are saying I'm determined I'm, I want to make heaven my home those are the people who are called disciples but those who run back at a little difficulty those are not disciples those, those who run back when you abuse them when you when you have something against them, when you discipline them, those are not disciples, those who grumble and murmur, those who are not able to bear their cross because somebody insulted them, those are not the disciples of Christ, disciples are those who are bearing the cross whatever the cross may be in their way, on their shoulder, and whatever weight they are feeling, they are just marching on and going on, and they are just uh, looking upon Jesus the also and the finisher of their faith whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, and number five in uh, Luke chapter 14 verse 33 so likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has he cannot be my disciple what is that saying for you to forsake I'll tell you you know sometimes there are some things that become part of you and they belong to you as your hand belongs to you. And that thing that is so close to you as your, as your hand is hindering you from making progress in the kingdom of God. It may be a friend. And this friend, whenever he comes, he doesn't talk faith. He doesn't talk love. He talks hatred and unbelief and doubt. He talks in a critical way. And every time he talks, it is darkness and cloud. Every time he talks, it is discouragement. Every time he talks, it is, let us go back to the world. Every time he comes, it is, let us not serve the Lord anymore. And you know, it is so dear to you as your hand. He is so dear to you as your eye. And if you do not forsake that person that is pulling you away back from the way to heaven, there is no way you can be a disciple. A disciple is the one that is able and willing and ready to forsake all things that hinder him in the way to heaven. And that's why Jesus said if your hand causes you to offend cut it off and throw it away because it is better for you to enter into heaven maimed, into life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell fire that never shall be quenched. And if your eyes, somebody precious to you as your eye, somebody dear to you as your eye, somebody very delicate in your life as your eye if it causes you to offend, pluck it out and throw it away because it is better for you to enter into heaven with one eye than having two eyes and get into hell fire and be crying for water in eternity and there will be nobody to cool your tongue in the flame of fire in hell and that's why Jesus is saying if you are not willing not ready to forsake all things that will draw you back you know there is no way you'll be able to make heaven if you have read Pilgrim's Progress written by John Boyan that man is called Christian in that a Pilgrim's Progress and you know he was going to heaven and he was calling eternal life eternal life, eternal life and you know what his wife did, his wife came out of the door calling him and he put his two hands in his ears saying eternal life eternal life and the children they came out of the doors calling him daddy come back, daddy come back, don't go to heaven, let us enjoy the world let us have the pleasures of the world and he put the two fingers and the ears calling eternal life and running away and Mr. Pliable joined him and as they fell into the ditch of despair and uh, you know Mr. Christian was sorrowful because of the despair, the discouragement and the distress in his life, Mr. Pliable said, is this what we're going to get? And Mr. Pliable went back. And God showed Mr. Christian some steps that he came out of that mire. And he went on his way, saying, I still want to make heaven. You know, if you are like that, Pliable may be your friend. An undecided man, an unstable man may be your friend. But if you really are a disciple, you are saying, I want to make heaven. Heaven is my home and that is where I'm going. I want to remind you that in Pilgrim's Progress, that man, Mr. Christian, Christian, he came to a place where he slept and went because he was tired. You know, the Christian life, sometimes you are weary, sometimes you are tired, sometimes you are tried, sometimes you are tempted, sometimes you are re rebuked, sometimes you are reproached, sometimes you are persecuted, sometimes the devil comes against you like a running lion and you are saying, am I able to go through? Will I be able to make it? And you know, Mr. Christian, he was so tired and he slept and by the time he woke up, he went on his way, climbing a mountain and it was a difficult mountain. You know, 
from earth to heaven is a mountain. And if you're a disciple, you must climb that mountain. And the grace of God will be supporting you. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. As you're making up your mind, this heaven, I will go. Every step you are climbing that mountain, you say, Oh God, if I don't have your grace, I will fall back. Oh God, if you don't support me, I will fall back. But I know your grace is sufficient for me because the thief is come to kill, to destroy, and to steal. But the Son of Man is come to give me life and life in abundance. And Moses came in. Moses was the law. But truth and grace came by Jesus Christ. Give me your grace. Give me your truth. Give me your power. Give me your spirit. Give me the enablement. I know you are climbing that mountain. And uh, Mr. Christian, he climbed the mountain. He got to the top of the mountain. He discovered the role of it on his hand. That was a testimonial. That he was a Christian. The testimony, the witness. It had fallen off while he was sleeping. And Mr. Christian started looking for that role because if, if that role was not in his hand, when the role is called up yonder, he will not be found. He will not be there. Well, if the testimony is not in your heart, if the assurance is not in your heart, if that paper, eh, the, the confidence is not in your heart, when the role is called up yonder, you will not be able to make it. And Mr. Christian went back, he looked for it, and he came back again. When he found it, and he started climbing that mountain again. You know, the way to heaven is a high mountain. But the promise of God is, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's a man that wants to make heaven. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, if that determination is not there to cut off everything, everything that will hinder you from making heaven, you will never be able to stay at a, as a disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all, for forsaketh not all. He cannot be my disciple. Listen to me. Sometimes it is the television that is standing in your way. You like to pray. You like to consecrate. You like to be serious. You like to be sober. You like to be vigilant. But you know, every night you are sitting before that television and you laugh your conviction off. You wanted to pray. You wanted to be serious. You wanted to read your Bible. You wanted to get deep in spiritual things. But you know, when you stay in front of that television and those people, comedians and clowns are making you happy in the wrong way, in the sensual way, in the, in the demonic way, you know, you just forget wanting to pray. You just forget wanting to read your Bible and you finish every night in front of the television box and it steals your heart away. It steals your joy away. It steals your consecration away. That's what the Bible is saying. Whatever it is that will hinder you from making heaven, from getting serious and getting dedicated and consecrated unto the Lord, you just uh, throw it away. You cast it away. You forsake it. That's only when you are a disciple. It may be that second wife that is, you know, looking at you and saying, are you going to make restitution? You know how much I love you. You know how much I just would like to give my body and everything to you and you know that you know I can never fit into the life of any other person and you know the word of God that is only one man one woman and you have God the single woman that you are going through with and you know the second woman is in your life and pulling you back you want to be serious you can never be serious you want to pray you can never pray you want to do right you can never do right and every decision you take when you go back that second wife is going to tell you that well don't do that in this house and you are never you are not able to serve God and you know who's so ever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, all those uh, second women, third women, and all the prostitutes and harlots outside that will hinder you from serving God. If you don't get rid of all of them, there is no way you'll be able to make heaven. A disciple, follow me. It's number one, somebody who is saved, really saved, soundly saved, and truly saved and genuinely saved. And a disciple is one that, you know, loves God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, and all his strength. And he loves Christ. He loves Christ. And he will give up anything for the love of Christ and he loves the brethren. A disciple is one who is so consecrated to God, is willing to serve God, whatever others may do, whatever others may say. And You know, there are many people that have helped me in my Christian life, but you know, they are not my best friends today. They, they are not even in this church. Uh, they are in other places. The person that taught me music, the person that taught me the word of God, the person that taught me how to read my Bible, the person that taught me how to get through things. Many, many years ago when the Lord was telling me, uh, you know, to start preaching in this deeper Christian life ministry, that brother, well, did not understand and he stayed in our old church. But you know, I had to cut off my right hand. I had to cut off and pluck out my right hand. I said, I'm going to follow the Lord. My brother, it wasn't easy. 
It wasn't easy. Those people, you know, were eating together. We rarely washed together in the same blood of Jesus Christ. We sang together. We did everything together. It wasn't easy, but I wanted to make heaven. And, you know, to serve God at whatever cost, at whatever cost, no, no matter my right hand cut off, my right eye plugged out, or whatever I was going to lose in my life. And as a disciple, and if you are not ready to do that, you remain in that bad job where you are making a call to destroy the nation. You remain in that bad job where you where you're making tobacco and you're not willing to cut it off because of money that's not a disciple but a disciple is one who loves God so much that whatever you are going to cut off whatever you are going to just remove away from your life you'll do it at any cost forsaking all things and you know a disciple is one that is bearing fruit bearing fruit because in John chapter 15 John chapter 15 I'm reading verse 8 herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit so that so shall ye be my disciples. You know how to glorify the Father? To bear fruit. And you know how to be a real disciple? To bear fruit. And you know if you are not bearing fruit in your life, if you are not really bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And if you are not bearing those fruits, you are not a disciple. But it's only when you are bearing these fruits of the Spirit that you are really the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, you'll be bearing fruit in your testimony. You'll be bearing fruit in witnessing. You'll be bearing fruit in drawing others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me ask you, since when did you bring a soul to Jesus? If you are not bringing souls to Jesus, by the impact of your life, by the influence of your life, if you are not bringing souls to Jesus by what you do, by what you say, by what you preach, by how you pray, you are not a disciple because a disciple will be a fruit. In verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You see, if you're a disciple, you'll be bearing fruit. And in Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, verses um, 37 and 38, And when it was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples, the whole multitude of the disciples, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice, with all the might, for all the mighty works that they had seen. You know, if you're a real disciple, you'll be rejoicing at the exaltation of the master. When the master got on that uh, ass's colt, and people spread their, their garments on the floor, on the ground, and Jesus was walking majestically into Jerusalem. The true disciples were rejoicing. The fake disciples, the people did not love Jesus, they were complaining. And they were saying, you know, in verse 38, the disciples were saying this, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But you know, those who are not real disciples, they got angry. They were unhappy at the exaltation of Christ. They were unhappy at the promotion of Christ. They were unhappy when the people were shouting the praises of Jesus. And in verse 39, and some of the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees, let me tell you this, there are many sins in the Bible. There are Pharisees. There are Sadducees. There are those who don't want to see Christ exalted. And there are those who don't want to see others exalting Christ. And you see, all these Pharisees and Sadducees and don't want to see and don't want others to see, all these people, you know what they were doing? They said in verse 39, and the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said, Master, rebuke their disciples. But you know the point? The true disciples are rejoicing. The true disciples are glad. The true disciples are really following the Lord. And when Christ is exalted, when Christ is glorified, when Christ is promoted, when Christ is doing marvelous things and, you know, is lifted up in the minds and the hearts of people, the true disciples are rejoicing. Now listen to me. It doesn't matter how a disciple may be feeling. A disciple may sometimes be sick, but is rejoicing because Christ is exalted. A, a disciple may be poor, but is rejoicing because of the riches of Christ. A disciple may have problems 
but is rejoicing because Christ is seated on high at the right hand of the Father. That's a disciple. That's a disciple. But you know, those who are Pharisees and Sadducees and don't want to see and don't want others to see, they'll be grumbling and murmuring because they do not want Christ exalted. But you know, the real disciples are just too happy that Christ is exalted. And you know, number eight, we we'll read in Mark chapter four. Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading in verse 34. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. You know, those disciples, they were just desirous to learn of Christ in his word. Every time, you know, they'll come nearer unto Christ, they will ask questions. Not with an attitude to argue, an attitude to learn. They, they will drink in the word of God. They will get near Jesus Christ and they will learn from the word of God. They were just so eager, so desirous, so happy to come unto the Lord and to learn of his word. And you know, those are real disciples. You ask yourself, are you a disciple? Are you truly saved? Are you a disciple? Do you love God and Christ and the brethren? All times, everywhere whatever their tribe, whatever you are going through. Are you a disciple? Are you fully consecrated to serving God? Whatever daddy, mommy, brother, sister, and whatever your friends may be doing or saying, are you a disciple? Are you following Christ at the great cost of bearing your cross? Are you a disciple? Are you forsaking all things that hinder? Let me ask you. Do you love Christ enough to be able to do away with jewelry? and painting, and eyelashes, and finger paintings, and all these, uh, all these other worldly things? Or is Christ having the same place, the same value to you as jewelry, as silver, as gold, as the things of this world? But you know, true disciples love Christ at whatever cost. Whatever they have to give up, they'll give it up to show their love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you love God enough? Love the word of God enough to be able to deny yourself of that television box? Or does, are you leaving the church because only because of television? You know, there are people like that. They say, I love that church. I love that church very much. I just love their standard. I love the miracles there. I love the revival there. I love the way God is answering prayers, but I love my television more. And if it were not because they do not allow their, their members to watch all the, all the harlots and all the evil and all the, all the evil things over the television, if they were allowing their members to see everything, I would have been in that church. But because they want to take my television away from me, I think I would do away with Christ and keep my TV. Are you like that? That the suffering of Christ does not mean anything to you because of television? Now listen to me, listen to me. I'm serious now. Those programs over, it's not the television box, it's not the electricity, it's not the screen, it is the program inside that that I'm telling you about, that you know you shut your eyes over things that will pollute your mind and make you unclean and make you to go away from the Lord. I know if you love the Lord enough, you're able to separate from that box. And if you don't love the Lord enough to be able to separate from that box, I'm just here to tell you tonight, you are not a disciple. You are just struggling to be, but you are not. But you know, if you're a real disciple, you'll be bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, and you'll be rejoicing at the exaltation of Christ, and you'll be designing to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time there is time for Bible study, you'll be happy, you'll be jumping, you'll be running to the Bible study. But you know, there are people who are not so happy to come, to study the Bible. If you're a disciple, you will. And so we've seen in Acts chapter 6 that these disciples, with all these qualities I've talked to you about tonight, they were multiplying. They were multiplying in the early church. But then there was a problem, and I told you last week. But I'm here to tell you this week um, the senselessness of what they did. In fact, the foolishness of what they did. They, they, it looked to me that they just put their dirty feet in their mouth when they were grumbling and murmuring because, you know, this church became a large church. There were thousands of people in the church. Now, look up at me here. Those of you are fathers and mothers. When you have only one child, it's easy. Uh, you know, you say you are going to buy a toy, you are going to buy this, you are going to buy that for that child. That's very easy because you have only one child. But now you have two children, three children, four, five, six, seven, eight. When you have eight children, there are times when you buy things for eight, uh, sorry, for six, and you forget two. You love all of them alive. 
but somehow, unintentionally, unknowingly, you have forgotten to give that same thing uh, to, uh, to those two people. Or it may just be that you are, uh, when you were coming on the way from work, you bought donuts, ground nuts, or, or you, bought, you bought whatever it is just to, just to keep the mouth cracking. And um, your, there were some six children around, and you say, okay, take yours, take yours, take yours. And there remain two that uh, you just didn't remember. Now, if those two other children are wise, you know what they will do? They will not go and be murmuring to their brothers and sisters. They will come to you and say, Daddy, are you forgetting me? That's what wise children will do. And that's, that's what every Christian in the church will do. When the church is large, it is possible that, you know, when something is being done, when something is being distributed, you are forgotten in the zone, in the area, in the house fellowship because we are large. You shouldn't grumble. Even little children know that. They just go to daddy and say, Daddy, are you forgetting me? No, you shouldn't bring gossiping and backbiting and murmuring and complaining and whispering and eating up the preacher. And you know, I, I've taught in schools before. And I told uh, the first um, Bible study class uh, last Monday that I've had the privilege of teaching primary one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I've taught secondary one, two, three, four, five. And I've taught uh, HSC one and two. And I've taught prelim and uh, university degree one, degree two. So I've moved up in teaching. And I know that when the, when the number of the children in the class, when they are large, the teacher has difficulty. But the higher you go, the less the number of children, at least in mathematics. And you know, when in my, in my university days, as I was lecturing, sometimes I have only 12 people to lecture, and it was very easy. But I remember when I was teaching uh, from five in the secondary school, and I had to teach uh, class A, class B, class C, class D. And they were very, very large. And you know, sometimes you mark all their papers, and you forget uh, the answer sheet of one student out of uh, 120 students. Now that student does not go around murmuring and grumbling and complaining. The, that student will be reasonable and come to the teacher and say, Teacher, you have forgotten me. And then I go back home and I search for that paper and I bring it to him. It's as easy as that. Shouldn't church members be as reasonable as from five teenagers? And when a church member has been forgotten, you'll do like that student of secondary school and you will come to the, to the pastor saying, Are you forgetting me? You know something in a large company? It is sometimes possible that you are working and there are so many workers there and the manager may be distributing, you know, just some gifts at the time of Christmas or at the time of Easter. And, and it may be that uh, in distributing that gift, it may be just a handbag distributing to everybody because, uh, you know, they just want to give this bonus to you at the Christmas time or Easter time and a worker there is forgotten. Now, what will the worker do? Mama? No. Even though he is not saved, he knows what is right. He'll go to the boss, he'll go to the director and say, Director, are you forgetting me? I've not got my bag, I've not got my bonus. That's what they do. Why is it that the church becomes so unreasonable that in a large church, when they are forgotten and something, peppermint or sugar or, or rice or beans or gary or little thing does not get to them, they murmur and they grumble. I'm so surprised that the church, the church, these people that were grumbling, they were not matured. Uh, you know, in our local government area, there are times that uh, the government of our stage has not remembered to repair our roads. And you know, our road is not tired. In our local government area, what do we do? Do we grumble? Do we mama? No. If we're reasonable citizens, we don't grumble, we don't mama. What do we do? We just send some delegates to the governor, to the governor's office. And in an amicable way, in a reasonable way, we just make the need of our local government area known unto the state government. That's what we do, even as sinners. Why doesn't the church behave in that same reasonable way? Like a little child in the family saying, Daddy, you have forgotten me. And the daddy will apologize and give that child the share that belongs to him. Like a secondary school teenager child of a his, of his student will uh, be forgotten in the distribution of the answer scripts. And that student will go back to the teacher. Teacher, you are forgetting me. Or like in the company, you are forgotten. And the bonus has not got to you. You just go to that person. Or like in the local government area. That's what we should do in the church. But you know, they didn't do that. They were unreasonable. And they started murmuring, grumbling, complaining. And you know, we should be ashamed for behaving below the level of a little child in the family. We should be ashamed. 
We should be ashamed for behaving below the level of a secondary school child. When we are forgotten, we start to murmur and complain. Now come on to chapter 6 of Acts, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. I'm here to just show you tonight that God is against murmuring. Listen to me. God is against murmuring in his church, grumbling in his church. My brother, my sister, you can get what you want sometimes by being a troublemaker. Sometimes in the church, you can get whatever you want by being a troubleshooter, by grumbling, by murmuring, by talking against everybody, by making such a loud noise that every, you catch everybody's attention until, uh, you know, the pastor will say, take and let me rest. And you will take it, you will get it. You know, sometimes you want attention, and the attention has not been given to you, and you murmur, you grumble, you growl, you complain, and you, you rough and with everybody, you talk against everybody, you pull the church down because you're a caterpillar in the church, and eventually the church people will say, Madam, get and let us rest. But that doesn't bring blessing to you. That doesn't help anybody if you grumble and then you get whatever you want. And God says you are just stubborn and rebellious. And the sin of stubbornness and rebellion is, is counted as a sin of witchcraft. And you are in the same category as witchcraft people. That doesn't help you. And you know, you can so do it to the point that you, you lose your life entirely. Now let me show you some people that murmured and grumbled in Israel. And see what God did in um, Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, I'm reading verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And he said, As the Lord indeed, spoken only by Moses, as he not spoken also by us, and the Lord heard it. Underline that. And the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. Heard it. You know, every time you grumble, the Lord hears it. Every time you murmur, the Lord hears it. Every time you complain, the Lord hears it. When he hears, he takes action. He does something immediately. And underline that word, the Lord heard it. And he did something. Look at verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And you know you can bring such judgment upon yourself because of murmuring, because of grumbling, because of complaining, and the hand of the Lord may be heavy upon you to judge you, to condemn you, and to bring evil upon you because of the murmuring, because you are eating up the pastor in your home. And because you are eating up the preacher in your home, the preacher becomes a peanut. And you know, you just eat up, eat up, eat up, eat up every time. Every time you are talking, you are talking about the pastor at home, about the preacher at home, about the Christian workers at home, about the brothers and sisters at home. And you know what? It brings judgment upon your home. You know, I had a story of a true man. I had a true story, rather, of a family. You know what happened? They belonged to a church. And they had been long in that church. And every time they came back from the morning worship on Sunday, they would say, well, the preacher did not preach well. He should have said this, he should have said that. In fact, they didn't like his dressing. They didn't like his communication. They didn't like the way he framed the message. And they, they suspected he must have been preaching against so and so. Every Sunday, every Sunday, they did that. They did that. And the children will be at the table eating with them. And they wouldn't enjoy their meal if they didn't eat a part of the, past, a part of the, a part of the pastor, a part of the preacher. If they didn't eat uh, the preacher with their peanuts, with their bread, they will not enjoy their meal. And they were just eating of the pastor, eating of the pastor. And the pastor will be coming smaller and smaller in their, in their eyes and in the eyes of their children. But I want to tell you this. The children became hardened. You know the pity of the sin? These people grumbling and complaining and murmuring, they remained in that church. And that was the only pastor, the only pilot that can take them to heaven. You know, your aeroplane is flying from us to heaven, the spiritual aeroplane. And the pilot in that aeroplane is a preacher. 
And you know, if you eat up that pastor, if you eat up that pilot, there is no way that aeroplane can land in the destination you want. And you know, they remain in that church. Eventually they died. I don't know where they went. But what I want to tell you is this, their children never got saved. Because the hearts of the children were hardened. They knew too much about the pastor. They knew too much about the wife of the pastor. They knew too much about the finance of the pastor. They knew too much about the blemishes and the shortcomings of the pastor. And the hearts of the children were hardened. And they never were able to get saved. Later in life, they became so hard, they will not even respect any gospel preacher. Not only that preacher, any other gospel preacher. And I want to tell you, they died and they went to hellfire. Because their, their parents were eating up the pastors, the preachers, at the meal table. And you know, it's dangerous for your family. It's dangerous for your life. It's dangerous for you to eat up the pilot and to eat up and to grumble and to murmur against the person that is leading you on your way to heaven. And in Numbers chapter 11... Numbers chapter 11, I'm reading verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. Mark it again. The Lord hears it all the time. The Lord heard it. The Lord heard it. The Lord heard it. You know, in the secret of your room, you gossip, you murmur, you complain against the church, against the leadership in the church. I'm telling you, the Lord hears it. You say, why are you saying we murmur against the pastor of the church? Well, because that's what they did in Acts chapter 6. They murmured against the apostles. And those apostles were the leaders of the church. And if they did it in the early church, there are people that may do it today. But when they do it, there is judgment. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them. That, they, that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. They murmured, and many of them were destroyed. You know, my experience, as I've uh, been a Christian for a number of years now, I traveled out uh, some time ago, and a church I've always loved. I went to, you know, visit that church, to worship with that church, and the pastor was so interested because I was coming from Nigeria and uh, this church is in America. And it's a church I don't want to mention because if I mention the church, the majority of you here will know the church in Nigeria here because they have their headquarters in America. And I visited that church and I talked with that church for hours, precisely for about six hours. Six hours. You know, he had been converted in the year 1941. And um, he became a pastor in 1958. And he said, uh, young man, I want to talk to you about pastoring, about preaching, about church administration. And he just continued talking and talking and talking to me about how to build up the church, how to keep unity in the church, how to help the church, how to make the church grow. But there's something he told me I will never forget. And it remained in my heart indelible until this time. He told me that in one of their branch churches in America, you know, that church, they teach salvation, they teach sanctification, they teach being baptized in the Holy Ghost, they teach divine healing, they teach restitution, they teach all the things that will help the people to live right if they really want to live right. But alas, many of them do not know how to make use of the message and live right. But you know what happened? There were some people in that church. You know, this man and woman, they had been in that church for years, for years. And they had children, and you know, these children also had children. And there was a lady in the church. The father and the mother were born in the church. And the father and the mother of his own, of her own parents, they were in that church before. So she was second, third generation in that church. And she said she was saved. She was dressing like a Christian. Look at her ears. The ears did not have holes because they do not use jewelry like we don't use jewelry. But you know, uh, that lady wanted to get married. The pastor said, you must do as you have been teaching you in the word of God. And the lady said, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to live like that. And the pastor said, look, I'm the pastor here. You must be obedient to what I'm saying because the Bible says submit yourself to those that watch over you because they need to do it with joy. And this pastor talking to me in New York City, he told me that that lady just said, no, I'm sorry, I will not obey you, pastor. And then when the pastor said, you must obey, or else, uh, you know, I will stand against your marriage, the lady said something. He said, I will prove to you I was born in this church. I will prove to you that my father, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, they were in this, they have been in this church. I'll prove it to you. And she started gossiping. 
she started murmuring she started complaining and you know eventually she even got to the headquarters of that church in america and they investigated the case and those people because of the lies and the murmuring and the complaining they removed that pastor they said the pastor was wrong because that lady he had been in that church for she had been in that church for a long time she knew how to get her way through and they put that church in another that pastor in another branch church and that lady had a marriage did everything and was bragging i told that pastor that I, I was sure that pastor I was born in this church. But you know what happened? In a few years after that marriage, she had terrible, violent, demon case possession like they had never seen in that church. She was so demon possessed, so violent, it was so terrible that they prayed, prayed, and prayed, there was no answer. They prayed in that branch church, there was no answer. They wrote to other branch churches, they prayed, there was no answer. At the headquarters church, they prayed and there was no answer. And they will not take her to the hospital because that church, they don't use medicine. But you know, it remained like that for a long time. She had her time and now God visited judgment upon her. You know, I'm telling you something. To backbite, to murmur, to grumble is a terrible thing. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10 first corinthians chapter 10 verse 10 neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and they were destroyed of the destroyer neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and they were destroyed of the destroyer isn't the destroyer still going about the devourer ro ro roaming about and running as a lion he will devour those who break up the edge. You know, by murmuring and gossiping, you can break up the edge. By murmuring and gossiping, you can allow evil spirit to enter into you. By murmuring and gossiping, you can allow uh, everything that is negative and bad and destructive to come upon your life. And you know, I'm asking you the question tonight, are you a pillar in this church? Are you a caterpillar in this church? What's your business in this church? Going from house to house as a tail bearer. Going from house to house as a, murmur, as a person murmuring. How about the people that come to visit you? What do you discuss with them? You discuss the pastor, you discuss the workers, you discuss the church. Tearing down, breaking up, dividing, bringing discord. Beware, the judgment of God is coming. And you know, eventually, when you die, they may bring you here. Bury you, give you nice burial. But you may open your eyes in hellfire, crying for water, being in torment forever and ever. Because while on earth, you are only outwardly a believer. But internally, you are a caterpillar. You are destructive. Your tongue was sharp as a razor blade. And you are more money. You could cut down anybody. Already you have cut down all the people that could help you. No counseling can help you. No preaching can help you. Because even the preacher is small in your side. How can you be saved? Rise up and pray. Call upon the Lord. You know your life. You know your tongue. You know your murmuring. You know your complaining. You know your gossiping. You know your backbiting. You know, if you remain there and the Lord comes, there is no way you can make it at the rapture. The Bible says that very clearly, very clearly. If you don't get it out of your life, root it out of your life, control your tongue and bring your tongue under control, there is no way you'll be able to make heaven. You'll just know that the trumpet has sounded, the children of God, the saints of God have gone, and you are left behind to face the ordeal of the great tribulation of the Antichrist. Call upon the Lord, call upon the Lord, call upon the Lord, call upon the Lord, call upon the Lord. Let him save you, let him restore you, let him change your life. Your tongue can dig your grave, your tongue can cut you down, your tongue can take you away from heaven and make you to go to hell. Come back to the Lord, repent before the Lord. Let me come and apostate. A reprobate. You get to the point where the word of God does not affect you anymore. It means to be so long with murmuring, you are now dead to the call of the Spirit. You are now blind to the word of the Lord. The fire doesn't burn within you anymore. But you can call upon the Lord so you don't open your eyes in hell on the last day.
you love God and Christ and the brethren? Are you fully consecrated to God, whatever others say and whatever others do? Are you behind the cross? Want you to make heaven at all cost? Are you forsaking anything that will be a hindrance unto you? A friend, a neighbor, a gossiping friend, cutting off the right hand, plucking off the right hand. Are you doing it? It's why all the television box because of it, because of it, we never can be serious and dedicated and consecrated unto God. Do you love the word of God? Want you to study, want you to read, want you to measure your life with the word of God? Are you a disciple? Are you rejoicing at the exaltation of Christ? Are you happy at the growth of the body of Christ? Are you a disciple? Let him cleanse you. Let him wash you. Let him change your life. Let him control your tongue. A dirty heart will produce a foul mouth. A critical heart will produce a critical tongue. We are always cutting down preachers, cutting down people. There's something wrong with your experience with God. And the Lord may come tonight. When the Lord is coming, be ready. Prepare to meet your God. 